Brother Nakia gave me the signal, told me it's time to kick things off. Amen. Let's welcome the presence of the Lord here. Lord, we praise you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, we lift you up today. We magnify your wonderful name here, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you do, for searching us, cleansing us, washing us free of sins. Oh, we ask that you move in this house, Lord, to pour out your spirit, your anointing, God, and you have your way. <clears throat> Amen, in Jesus' name. Amen. You happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Yeah, that's good. Amen. It's been a long week. Amen. <clears throat> good to have the Gotros back. Amen. I guess they're done playing in the land of snow. That's good. Amen. Amen. That's right. Back to reality. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Romans chapter 5, and we will read verses 17 through 19. Amen. Romans 5, 17 to 19. Amen. Don't worry, Brother Donnie, I'm not going to tell on you that you overslept and missed Sunday school last week. So, <laughs> Your secret is safe with me. Amen. Oh, it slipped out. Sorry. <laughs> He was here for service and was, did a great job worshiping. Good job. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> that says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Amen. You may be seated this morning. And this morning we're going to start out with a question. Who was the first person in your family history that you know of to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? You know, some folks in here, you may have a long you know, family history. Others may be first time. Brother? Me. You. Amen. Sister? Mom. Your mother. Amen. Sister? Dad's mother. Your dad's mother. Brother? Grandmother. Your great-grandmother. Amen. Sister? Grandfather. Great-grandfather. You were? Me too. Brother? First that you know. Sister? Come in, sister. Wow, that goes way back. Great, great, great grandmother. Amen. You get the prize. <laughs> That's awesome. Amen. Amen. Like many of you, I was the first as well. Brother Gotro? Nice. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's good. That's a good testimony. Amen. So God speaks to people even in the bars. Everywhere. Amen. Today we will begin a new series. The series is You Must Be Born Again. We'll look closely at the New Testament plan of salvation and we'll cover four lessons. These lessons will cover the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins, the necessity of repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Human beings were made living souls. The creation account in the first two chapters of Genesis focus on the creation of people from two different perspectives. The first, found in Genesis chapter 1, reveals both male and female are cre created in the image of God. Both share equal blessings and responsibilities. 
The second account is found in Genesis chapter 2. This emphasizes the material and immaterial aspects of human existence. Physically, so the material, physically, humans are made from the earth. Their immaterial component springs from the breath of life that God breathed into man's nostrils. These two accounts offer no hint of sinfulness in humans. Instead, humans are portrayed in hopeful and positive ways. Though made of earth, which was created by God, humans are more intimately related to their creator than any other created thing. God has personally breathed into humans' nostrils. The result is the image of God, supremely blessed and capable. But to be made in God's image includes the fact that people possess the power of choice. Since God has the freedom to choose, so do humans. Since this is the case, God warned Adam to avoid the things that would destroy him. Genesis 2 and 16 to 17 says, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof shalt thou surely die. Both Adam and Eve exercised their freedom of choice in disregarding this warning. And as a result, they both suffered the consequence, death. Since neither of them experienced physical death at the time, some may think that in his mercy God changed his mind. After all, Adam lived 930 years. But this was not the case. God's warning was not about a physical death, but it was about a spiritual death. Let's go to another question. Do you agree with the idea that the power of choice is the greatest power that people possess? Why or why not? Sister? Yes, because we do not like to go to church. Amen. It's true. People, like people don't like to be told what to do. They like to make their own choices, right or wrong. That's good. Anybody else a thought on that? Brother? Yeah, so your choices are going to impact, and they can impact for generations. So you could have a great, 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 great grandparent that got the Holy Ghost, and that could trickle down so that others make good choices too. Amen. Anybody else? So those are, you know, the power of choice is a very important thing that we have, that God has given us. Biblical references to death are always about a kind of separation. When someone dies, they do not cease to exist. Every person ever born will exist forever. When a person's die, person dies, that person's material and immaterial components are separated. James illustrates this point when he wrote in James 2 and 26. He said, for as the body, so that's the material, Without the spirit, that's the immaterial, so for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Adam did not become a living soul until God breathed into his nostrils. So God breathed life into him, making him a living soul. When they sinned in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve experienced a spiritual death. They were separated from fellowship with God. They were expelled from the garden. And Paul writes about this in several places in Romans chapter 5. He says, Wherefore, as, as by one man sin entered into the world, so that's Adam, and death by sin. 
And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. By one man's offense, many died. By the one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Sin reigneth in death. So sin causes a spiritual death because it separates us from fellowship with God. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 and 5 says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And were dead in sins. So sin results in a spiritual death. So this is not a physical death, but a spiritual death that the scriptures are referring to. So let's go to another question. If death refers to separation, what do you think it means to be dead to sin? So separated from sin. So if we're dead to sin, then we must be alive in Christ. Amen? So death refers to separation. Sister? Yes, you were dead to that. It no longer rules you. Amen. That's good. The Garden of Eden, as you know, contained many trees, but only two had special significance. The tree of life was there to provide an opportunity for Adam and Eve to live forever. The tree of knowledge of good and evil gave them an opportunity to exercise their freedom of choice. This option was necessary in order to make their relationship with God meaningful. God loved them, and he wanted them to love him in return. But love is meaningful only when it is a choice. After their sin, Adam and Eve were expelled from Eden to prevent them from eating of the tree of life and living forever. But the tree of life was not there to impart eternal life or salvation. It was there to prevent them from physical death. It would not do for them to to continue to inhabit the garden in a state of rebellion against God. So they rebelled against God when they chose to eat of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, they could not stay there. From the earliest days of human history... Relationship with God is made possible by faith, not by eating from a tree. The connection between sin and death is seen in Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death. And again, it's not talking about physical, but spiritual death because it results in separation from God. Romans 5 and 12 to 21 Paul explained in a carefully worded argument the negative universal impact of Adam's sin. He wrote in Romans 5 and 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so you're always seeing this recurring theme, death by sin. Sin separates us from God. It results in a spiritual death. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So everybody has sinned. Therefore, we need a Savior. The consequences of sin upon humanity was universal death or separation from God. You cannot be in sin 
and have fellowship with God because sin and God do not dwell together. So how do you get out of sin and have fellowship with God? Through repentance. Jesus' name baptism, being filled with God's spirit. <clears throat> Beginning at Romans 1 and 18, Paul showed that all people fail up to live to what God wants them to. He said, all are sinners and need a savior. Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned, that's past tense, and fall short, that's present tense, of the glory of God. But it's important to notice that not only has every person sinned in the past, but all continually to fall short of God's glorious revelation. This is why the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from sin as we walk in the light with our faith in Jesus. Sin is universal. All people need a Savior. Even before Jesus' birth, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. The angel informed him of the name to be given to Mary's son and the reason for that name. Matthew 1 and 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. So why call his name Jesus? Because for he shall save his people from their sins. Literally, the name Jesus means Yahweh Savior or Jehovah Savior meaning he is Savior or he shall save. So you shall call him Jesus because he shall save humanity from sin. Romans 6 and 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice the contrast between wages and gift. We earn wages by the work that we do. For the wages of sin is death. We do not earn gifts. The gift of God is eternal life. The consequence of sinful behavior is separation from God, with in separation from fellowship with God. Eternal life can be described as life forever in God's presence. It is a free gift of God. So we'll end with this. According to Paul, this is the gospel in its most succinct form. 1 Corinthians 15 and 3 to 4. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. To receive the benefits of this good news, it is essential to believe in Jesus. John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Genuine belief results in obedience. This obedience is not a work, but it is a response to faith. To those who asked on the day of Pentecost, what shall we do? Peter answered, he said, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I think today we have made the case that all have sinned. Sin separates us from fellowship with God, so therefore we all need a Savior. Next week what we'll do is we will look at obedient faith and how that is the path that takes us to salvation. Amen. Well, let's stay in this morning. It's a short lesson. That gives us extra time for prayer before service, right? Amen. So let's go to the Lord. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We give you the praise, the honor, the glory today. We thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice on the cross. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation that sin separates us from fellowship with you and through obedience faith, Lord God, we can return to fellowship with you. We thank you, Jesus, for the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
We praise you this morning, Lord God, and we worship you. We ask that you move in this service this morning, Jesus, that you'll prick our hearts this morning and that we'll be led of the Spirit. Oh, we give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Fellowship a bit, and then I left you plenty of time for prayer before service.